is Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having an unbelievable start to your weekend. Uh, as for me, it's business as usual. Um, here is another installment on the series on the disintegration of the black family nucleus and the impact it's having on uh, the black collective as a whole. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the importance of proper racial socialization and what the family, the role the family plays in that. I'm going to uh, get started on started on that in a second, but I want to remind everybody that we are in the middle of a fundraiser and the work we do in the inner city uh, and the black collective as a whole is immensely important. Uh, if you are familiar with me, you have followed me, you believe in the work I do, go to the description box or wherever you're watching this video and use one of the means, whether it's clicking the link or sending uh, support via Cash App, whatever works for you. Show some love, show some support. On that note, I'm going to get started. Now, uh, what I've been doing is I've been reading from my 23rd book, which is, um, I don't know, the, the glare is sometimes. The Undoing of the African American Mind, an Introduction to Collective Cognitive Bias uh, Syndrome. Um, and it is the sequel to my 19th book, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. Um, both of the links will be in the description box, but um, this is a play out of my research. Um, up until that point, 19 was written a while ago, 23 was written uh, some years ago, but they're still relevant and I'll be following up with something new within the next year or so uh, based off of what my research uh, furthers. Uh, so I'm going to read from a part that says, Failure to Properly Socialize African American Adolescent Males, uh, in, in specific here. And I'm going to read this particular section, and then I'm going to break it down to you. Uh, it says, While it is clear that the absence of the black man in the home and black community has a negative impact on the home and community in multitudinous ways, the absence of adult males in the black community has created a situation in which it has become difficult to properly culturally and racially socialize young black males. Socialization is a term that is used in the discipline of sociology, psychology, anthropology, political science, and education, and it refers to the lifelong process of inheriting and disseminating norms, standards, customs, values, ideologies, and so forth, which provide an individual with the skills and habits necessary to successfully acclimate and compete in the world that encapsulates them. Racial socialization is the second most prevalent influence indicator and predictor of African American adolescent male uh, adolescent male violence next to uh, the feeling of being disrespected. Which we will call the respect factor. One mistake that has been made constantly is attempting to address the enigmatic issues that plague African Americans using the paradigms and standards set forth through a Eurocentric ideology. African Americans are the product of a highly unique experience and to judge them based on norms and standards that fail to consider the uniqueness of the African American experience is, futile, is a futile endeavor. When it comes to the experiences of contemporary African American male youth, there are a number of specific conditions that must be considered in order to ensure the efficacy of the evaluation and the possibility of any subsequent responses and solutions. Some of the psychological, political, and economic pressures that serve as impediments for young African American males include economic inequalities, unemployment, underemployment, racial intolerance, the lack of education, and the fear and threat of violence. According to a study conducted by Dr. Jar DeGroote, proper racial socialization is the second most prevalent factor in predicting and impacting the proclivity for violence in African American adolescent males, second only to the feeling of the, or the perception of being disrespected. 
basically the frustrations of many African-American adolescent males are directly associated with the debilitating experiences that they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Perceiving these frustrations as an indication of malevolence, mistreatment, or mar and marginalization by the larger social systems that are in place. These systems could be the educational system, the judicial system, or even black culture in general. Because these youth, these youth are not properly socialized, it is difficult for them to properly frame the context of their struggles within the system. The presence of a, ro a male role model would have provided a proper perspective and example of how to deal with inherent resistance and opposition that is inextricably connected to the black experience. However, the absence of this knowledge and experience results in hypermasculinity, leading to adolescent male, uh, leading the adolescent male to attempt to satiate his natural yearning for respect and authority within his environment through violence. This is dangerous in two ways. First, it is likely that the frustrations being experienced by the black adolescent male will result in an act of violence, or the polar response would be to develop an inferiority complex that views the dominant society as superior based on how the white male is treated in comparison to themselves. Another way that African-American adolescent males are impacted by the lack of a positive role model, <clears throat> positive role model uh, to assist them in the socialization process and to help them establish the baseline for their racial and cultural identity can easily impact the youth's ability to develop the capacity and capability to effectively conduct cognitive appraisals, resulting in erroneous and fallacious responses to different types of stimuli. Basically, no control and no ability to control their emotions. Because one parent is attempting to carry the load, they are rarely home, meaning that the entire load of educating black youth has fallen on the shoulders of the public education system that is neither equipped nor designed to educate black youth to compete with their non-black counterparts. Blacks have lost sight of the fact that education is more than the attainment of academic skills. Education must be viewed as a holistic process that is initiated at the point in which the child reaches self-awareness. Education includes the entire process of experiencing and the gathering of knowledge that equips a person to effectively engage the obstacles and challenges of life. The family nucleus is where this process is initiated. Although the family serves as the ideal environment to introduce many of the concepts that represent a, a, a complete paradigmatic shift in how blacks view the world around them. The disintegration of the black family is also one of the reasons that young black male population has fallen victim to the aggression of the private prison industrial complex. And furthermore, these young men are being primed for incarceration through the use of the public education system as it supports the contrivances that directly serve, to school, serve the school to prison pipeline. It is important to understand the rele relevance of the black family. The restoration of the black family nucleus is key to the elevation of the black race as a whole. The black family is, a, is the smallest and most concentrated institution through which the principles that are key to empowerment and elevation of the black race are effectively disseminated. Um, we're going to stop it there. So uh, in research, what we find is that we know that there is a prevalent role that black men play in the advancement of the black collective as a whole. If we're talking about black empowerment, we cannot uh, extract the importance of the black man uh, and expect to gain um any meaningful progress. This is why there is no problem with the white caste system giving power access and uh, to higher education and to corporate America to black women because uh, they understand that without the black man as a physical catalyst, uh, there's still no real true movement. Uh, I always say it this way. We will never get any higher then our women are able to spiritually lift us and we will never get any further than our men are ably, able to physically lead us. So then if we understand the importance of the black male and we see that there is a problem with the development of strong black men. And I'm not saying we don't exist because I believe there's a, a significant number of strong black men. Of course, we're not going to get airtime. We're not going to get exposure. They're not going to put us front and center because it doesn't fit the narrative. The narrative is black men are hyper emotional. 
They can't manage their emotion, which makes them hyper violent and they're dangerous. They're criminal minded. They're lazy. They don't take care of their kids. All of these different things, which actually doesn't bear out in research. Research actually um, research actually bears out the fact that black men are uh, actually better fathers than non-blacks, especially whites and Latinos, which is often uh, considered the opposite. We spend more time with our kids. We're more engaged with our kids uh, than our white counterparts. We even contribute more of our uh, income towards our children than percentage-wise than white males. And, and so... Uh, this idea, this research is done by the Pew Research Center and um, also by uh, uh, Kaiser. So there are two uh, major research uh, institutions that have come up to the same conclusion. This is actually posted on the CDC website for those who uh, want to call me on that. You can go check that out. But... Uh, so what we find is that that's not the case, but still, we still have a significant number of young black males that are caught up in the system. We have uh, 1.5 million black males missing out of that 1.3 are in prison, and many were uh, herded there through the school to prison pipeline because of the lack of proper racial socialization, which normally is initiated within the black family, within the black home. And so let's talk about what racial socialization is socialization is something that happens to every child it's how they are prepared to go, go out into society and be productive it's they're given the rules of what to do what not to do how to carry themselves in certain situations how to speak to people how to move uh, what's acceptable what's not acceptable what's demanded of them uh, what's expected of them and on and on and on down the line but they're also told you're smart you're intelligent you can do anything you want to do and uh, you, you know all these different things the world is your oyster all these different things that will encourage them to go out and apply themselves and to do things but be prepared to deal with whatever may come their way well that's proper socialization and that happens with every child when it comes to black children and other children of color but let's stick with blacks when it comes to black children we have to do a double down which is racial socialization why because we have to let our kids know everything i just told you will be challenged the moment you walk out of here and you go off into their world you're going to see things that tell you you're not beautiful because of your features you're going to see things that tell you you're uh, inherently um less intelligent than they are that you have a certain intellectual inferiority that's a part of who you are that you are naturally this that you're that and that you can't do this you're going to have to be two or three times better in certain situations to get the same opportunities but you are capable you are beautiful it has to be anchored within their psyche it has to be inculcated with uh, into the deepest recesses of their mentality into their subconscious and this needs to be done before there's any significant exposure to the Eurocentric environment that they will have to operate in unless in some kind of way you create an enclave that's totally outside the scope of the mainstream. And there are certain people that have done that. But the reality is most of them are going to have to get jobs. Most of them are going to, even if they have their own businesses, have to deal with other people besides us. And so they need to understand who they are. That's socialization and racial socialization. So then how are they best socialized? Male or female, a child is best socialized with a balance of uh, feminine and masculine energy, the natural occurrence of roles by the woman and the man. And they are natural when they're in their natural instinct. They serve purposes in empowering kids. One of the things that you see, not just in the black community right now, but in general, out there are children who are confused about who they are, confused about what they should be doing because the roles have been uh, confused. There's this nebulosity or ambiguity about what a man is, about what a woman is, and all of this is creating this confusion. And see, the problem is when you're uncertain about who you are, there's a frustration in identity that starts to create disruption in behavior, especially when it comes to black males or males period, but males period, but let's talk black males. When, 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 when a male gets to be about 13, 14, 15, especially around 14, 15, 
there's this natural urge to have anchored themselves in an identity, a purpose, a sense of self, a sense of where they're going, a sense of belonging, a sense of worth. If they can't find that identity, if they can't find um, that worth, they will show it in their disruption, in their frustration, and in their behavior because it's a natural thing. I want to know who I am in, in my relationship with God. I want to know who I am and what I'm going to do in this world. How do I belong in this world? What's my role? Um, what do I believe in? My core values. That's what happens in the family. That's what the family is for. The family is for the inculcation of values, interests, and principles into the deepest recesses of the children in the family so that they can perpetuate the family values outward through their own progeny. But when you get a 15 year old who doesn't know who they are, who is searching for who they are, and they are questioning who they are, because not only is there no uh, consistent masculine energy in the home, but there's a constant bombardment of negative ideas, negative ideologies, uh, conflicting ideologies about what he's supposed to do. So now he's confused. He's trying to find himself and he can't. He doesn't seem to have a place because nobody wants to accept him. He's rejected almost by default. And so now he becomes frustrated. He starts to act out. And it's just a natural assumption he's act, acting out because that's what black men do without understanding that there is a societal disruption to the natural order. We went from in 1960 being in a place where 75% uh, of young black children were born into two parent households. So in roughly 60 years, we've gone from 75% of black children born in two parent households to 75% born in the single parent households or born to unmarried parents. And now we're, we're, we're slowly starting to see a slight reversal, but there's so much work to be done. And in the interim, how are we going to effectively and properly socialize? That's why I created Black Men Lead. Black Men Lead is a rite of passage initiative which serves to socialize young black males into black manhood, giving them everything they need to become everything that they are supposed to be. So in essence, when we look at this, we find out that um, disproportionality in special education as early as five years old is a problem. Why? Because we are expecting a system that wasn't designed for our boys to educate our boys. So as early as five years old, they're being herded into special education um, referrals and they're getting diagnosis from these school psychiatrists uh, and psychologists of ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder, both of which can be treated with medicine, which by uh, definition are psychotropic in nature. So psychotropic drugs like Renalin, Vibads, Concerta, uh, Adderall, and, and on are the ones that we are using to uh, make young black males more docile in the classroom so young white female teachers can feel safe and teach because they actually fear this little five-year-old kid. There's something wrong with him. He won't be still. He won't behave. Nobody's asking what's going on in the home because I talked to you about the importance of understanding what adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. Uh, we've talked about that. So we don't know what's going on in the home. See, his culture is different than hers. <laughs> We don't ask in this school system uh, some simple questions. Is this the best method or modality for teaching five and six year olds? And the answer is absolutely not. Asking a four, five, six, seven, eight year old to be still, be quiet, keep the noise level at zero when walking down the hall, uh, just all little things they find to label little black bars for uh, is absolutely absurd. Number one is kids under the age of eight learn by movement. They learn by movement. They learn by sound. They learn by music. They learn by active participation. The more movement you involve in their learning, the better they learn. And so when you sit up and you try to make a child who is five sit still for an hour or two hours, it's it's absolute torture and it's, it's uh, anti- uh, intuitive, counterintuitive 
to how they normally learn. So they're not only being asked to be in an immensely uncomfortable position, but you're mitigating their or marginalizing their capacity to actually effectively learn. Now, this is being pushed. Um, and it's going to be more exacerbated with young black males because of the culture and the environment they're coming from. Uh, we're, we're going to have to acknowledge that we're dealing with multi-generational trauma. Trauma has been transmitted uh, generationally down and we haven't dealt with it. We're going to have to deal with it. It's a real issue and it's going to be perpetuated and expressed through our children. And it's going to be done in places where they can be observed and they can be tagged for it. And we're going to have to start dealing with that. But when we don't have the family intact, this is what happens. And it's not just black boys. Black girls lose a sense of identity. They lose a sense of self-worth, a sense of self-value. They're looking to be validated. They're looking to hear, I love you from a man. Uh, they're looking to see what that love feels like because they don't have an example. They see all the stuff they see in videos. They see all the stuff they see online. They see this corrupted idea of what it's supposed to look like. And so they are willing to accept something substandard because they haven't truly experienced it. See, the first love affair that a girl has should be with her father. And I mean that in the purest sense. I'm not talking into that perverted bull crap. I'm talking in the purest sense. She should know how a man talks, what tone he uses with her. She should know that she can expect a man to elevate her in how he speaks into her life. She should be able to realize that he allows a, a certain level of safety to always be present when he's around. She should know when my daddy is present, ain't nobody messing with me. And that's the same thing I'm going to expect from my husband. I should never be made to feel low, down, less than, unloved by a man who says he has my back and he wants to be with me. And so these things too come from socialization and there's these different levels of socialization and understanding and all these things. She also needs to know how beautiful she is because she's going to go out into a world where people are going to actually desire to be like her, but give her a message that she's not good enough. While everybody's aspiring to have the curves of a black woman, the, fa the full facial features of a black woman, they're constantly sending a message that thin and uh, Eurocentric, uh, uh, Eurocentric um, physical characteristics are what's beautiful. The Eurocentric idea of what's beautiful is good for Euro Europeans. It's absolutely horrible for people of African descent. And so we must be willing to sit up and understand it's our responsibility to properly racially socialize our children into understanding and love of themselves at a level that they're not shaken when people start throwing darts at their beauty, when people start throwing, throwing darts at their intellect, when people start, start throwing darts at their creativity and the difference in which they move, in which they speak, in which they operate. And they need to embrace the beauty of who they are. They need to stop looking for acceptance among others and learn how to accept themselves and then uh, interpolate and insert themselves forcefully into a world that they have just as much of right to be in as anyone else. You don't sit up and wait for an, an invitation. You don't wait for someone to say it's okay for you to be there. You belong. Step into it. But don't think you have to become them in order to be accepted. Don't worry about acceptance. Take your space. They can either accept it or get out of the way, but that has to be done in the home. And it's best done in the balanced environment of masculine and feminine energy being synced to create a synergy that is forceful enough and powerful enough that those two people who are joined together becoming one, as in the term synced, becoming one, as in the term biblical, becoming one, now are capable of doing things as one that they could never do individually as as a male and a female. And that's the power of this thing that we're missing on a spiritual level, on a psychological level, on an emotional level, and even on a physical level. And those are the things that we need to be tapping into. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we need to be promoting the black family, not deriding it. We need to, uh, uh, Tiffany Banks Park and I were on talking about young missing girls. And one of the things we got into is family and this gender war. We need to understand that 
who's behind the gender war, who benefits from the gender war, who is going to be harmed most by this gender war. We are so fixated on this inner conflict that we don't realize who stirred the pot. It's like putting black ants and red ants in a jar and putting a top on it. If you don't bother them, they don't bother each other. But if you shake the jar and agitate them, the black ants will attack the red ants and vice versa. And no one ever thinks about who started it, who initiated it, who created it, who's getting pleasure from it, who's getting a benefit from it and uh, or whatever. And what we're going to have to do as a people is ask who's shaking the jar? Who's creating the conflict? Who benefits from the conflict? Who suffers from the conflict? We don't ask the right questions. And so we get caught up in small things as Dr. Claude Anderson would say, we, we are content on playing checkers while everybody else is playing chess. We tend to major in the minor. And what it does is it leaves us highly vulnerable to the machinations of the enemy. And it leaves us unprepared to make movements and progressive uh, leaps towards this thing we say we want called black empowerment, black liberation, true black freedom. It's up to us to recognize it. It's up to us to sit up and say, this is what I'm going to do about it, because we all have a responsibility in it. It's not just one person. That's the thing you got to get out of your mind. There's no Messiah, no one savior. It's about everybody standing up and being a part of the solution. It's about unifying and coming together and becoming one collective and understanding that in the home is the smallest uh, microcosm of this collectiveness. And when the home is disturbed, it's hard to build collectiveness outside of the home because there's no model of behavior. There is no example of what happens. If you are not joined and connected right in the home, it's hard to create that unity outside of it. And so these are the things that we have to look at. Um, I have spent my adult life and a considerable part of it studying the enigmatic issues that we face as a people uh, from serial force displacement, mass incarceration, uh, miseducation, uh, gentrification, uh, and, and so many other things. And multi-generational trauma has been my staple. It's literally uh, where uh, a great deal of my focus is in life, period. It's where I do a great deal of my business is in helping people deal with trauma. Uh, but understanding multi-generational trauma as it is directly associated with the black experience is a whole nother thing. But what I can tell you is that if we don't do something different, if we don't uh, change our approach, uh, to what we're doing. If we don't actively become engaged in changing things, if we don't behave or move proactively in solving issues and stop waiting and reacting to things, we're going to consistently see what we see, a widening of the wealth gap, a diminishment of power and relevance, and eventually we won't even be relevant in this country. There's a move to already replace us with Latinos. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here, but I really and truly hope that I left you with something. I'm sitting here and I'm kind of thrown because I'm looking at just how much I look like my great grandfather, who was my adopted father. If you know the story, you know the story. Uh, but uh, look. We're in the middle of a fundraiser. If you believe in the work we're doing, show some love, show some support. Uh, really think about the importance of the family and ask yourself, what can I contribute? How can I do it? Uh, but we've got to, in the interim, have programs like Black Men Lead available to young black males to help socialize them properly, racially socialize them, to mitigate violence, against themselves and others, and especially our young girls and women uh, to uh, improve their chance of developing the skill set to earn a living wage so that they can support a family. 
the, uh, to inculcate into their minds the importance and responsibility of creating a family, sustaining a family, and projecting the same values outward. Uh, it's so important. Uh, I hope that you get behind the work we're doing. I hope that the things that I'm sharing in these series, um, what we've done to this point and what we will do, continue to do moving forward, will be a catalyst for change. We've got so much work to do. Uh, I don't believe in the word can't, but we have a high mountain to climb. So it's up to us. On that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Thank you guys for giving me your time. Have a great day. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here Dropping in with a little special announcement For those who have followed me for any stretch of time You know outside of the businesses that I run Like Myriad Business Solutions The Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, In Houston, Dallas and other areas uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.